Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm as Tony so nicely introduced me. I do work for the Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife Service and I'm still very much operationally involved in fire on the ground. And I guess I'm here to talk about cultural change in, in really quite a small organisation and how it can be achieved, um, what it looks like. And, and I'm not a researcher and, and what I've done is I've looked at online websites and things like that and I guess this is how I've applied it. And so what I'm going to do today is tell you my story of what we've tried to do. For those of you who don't know, um, Tasmania is this delightful island in the southern part of Australia. Um, it's a zoomed in map just to give you an idea of the kind of um, tenure and area that we're talking about. The brown bits that you can see on the maps are the national parks or conservation areas. Um, the green bits are all the forests and forest conservation areas, forest reserves. So you can see we've got quite a lot of the state that's well vegetated and the yellow bits in the middle are um, actually largely agricultural land because Tasmania, although there's four sort of cities there, that's a very generous term for what are actually quite small towns. <laughs> um, so Tasmania is um, responsible for uh, the Parks and Wildlife Service. We're responsible for looking after about 35% of the state. We've got uh, 2.4 million hectares. Uh, we have 150 sometimes, it's a bit less than at the moment, 150 staff who are actively involved in uh, fire management, but that would be on top of their other duties quite often as a ranger or a field officer or something like that. And our fire management budget is about $3 million a year. So, yep, we're a pretty small organisation, but I actually think that's really helped us to achieve some really great things. And um, I would say that it's also an incredibly beautiful place to work and live. So, I guess the problem that we have is really, a bit of what Mike talked about as well, is this issue of different learning styles and I guess um, particularly when I'm working with our fieldies and our fireys and guys like that, we are kinesthetic learners and I'm a kinesthetic learner as well. And when I look at how we manage fires and our planned burns and things like that, we do it by paperwork. It just seems like such a wrong fit. And, and then we go to a debrief after one of these burns or bushfire responses and we sit in a room somewhere and we generate more paperwork. And we expect people to learn from that and change the way that they might do operations in the future. And it just doesn't really work. And, and what we do at Debris <laughs> is we... <laughs> and to be fair to these ladies, they were logistics officers at an <laughs> impossible burn on King Island where sourcing anything was very challenging. <laughs> but um, what we do at Debris is we just talk about what happened or we hear people complain about what happened. But very rarely have I been at a debrief where we actually tactically thought about, well, what did we do that for and why did we do that? And so we're rehashing the same issues, but we're never actually changing what we do. And, and I was just as guilty of the next person at being part of this. And I was accepting the status quo. This is the way we do things. It's not great, but it's kind of okay. You know, it's just what we do. And the only time I've ever noticed that we were really changing what we did was when we were forced to, when there was a coronial or one of those really brutal processes that are actually just quite demoralising for all the people involved. And also, I, yeah, just very demoralising and can actually really tear your organisation apart. And so it was my boss, um, Adrian Perk, who is the um, smaller of the two men in that picture, <laughs> Um, he first started introducing HRO concepts and in, 20, in 2004 he went to a workshop in Santa Fe and went on the Sierra Grande um, staff ride which most of you here would know an awful lot more about than I do and it was an impressive event and it was a really really changed Adrian's attitude and, and he came back very fired up to want to actually change the way we do things within um, Tasmania within the Parks and Wildlife Service in Tasmania 
Um, in 2006, he became the manager of the fire operations in Tasmania, and he really wanted to see cultural change happen in our organisation, and so he employed me. Um, <laughs> no, I was actually recruited for a brand new position um, with assurance and policy and training all wrapped up into one single role. And at about the same time, the Bushfire CRC started some new research um, in line with the University of Tasmania, looking at human factors in um, bushfire management. So during the 2006-2007 fire season, uh, many of us working in incident management teams were being filmed, and then we were being interviewed by these university boffins. And so, where's the scepticism? Well, that would be me. I was the sceptic. I was used to the way we did things. It was, we'd been doing them that way for a long time, and you know, it was okay. All things considered, we weren't doing too bad a job. And quite frankly, why was our bushfire CRC funding this wishy-washy, touchy-feely, human <laughs> factors kind of stuff? And you know, if I was thinking like that, you can imagine what my co-workers were thinking. However, I would have to hand it to Christine Owen and her team, but after being interviewed by them and having conversations with them, and reading through some of the materials they provided and some of the books that Adrian had brought back, I could actually see that maybe there was a role for this stuff and, and maybe we could actually change. And really what happened is talking with Christine and trying to explain to her how we did our business and why we did it that way, the questions she asked really started to make me think, we need to get out of the square. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a Bushfire CRC workshop on human factors that was run uh, by Christine and Mary Amati. And I really started to think, I can do this. And um, you know, I had all the support from my boss. He really wanted this to happen. But how do you do that? Well, at that time, we had some plan burns that exceeded expectations. Um, and one came perilously close to a private resident. And we had the typical and usual process of investigation. And it was typically brutal. And whilst they did find the cause of what went wrong in these burns, no one really learnt from it. Um, two of the ICs who were involved each had over 20 years experience and, and they'd really just been brutalised. And I guess to be honest the only ones who really learnt from those burns were the people who did the investigation. Not the actual staff who were involved, not the people who actually needed to be encouraged to change what they were doing. And so I approached the IC of one of the burns where the house was nearly lost and I said to him, why don't we do a staff ride? And then I told him what a staff ride was. But after explaining that to him, and, and the best way I could describe it to him was, look, we're going to walk through your hazard report rather than reading it. We're going to get on the ground and we're going to do it as a group. Phil, to his credit, he really wanted to give it a go. He really wanted others to learn from his experience. And so we decided to do a staff ride, and that is the extent of our planning. We were going to do a staff ride. And, and we got in and we did it, and we had a crack, and we were just going to make it up as we went along. We watched the staff ride video from Sierra Ground, which was great, that was very interesting. And we had a look at some of the resources available from the Lessons Learned website. And we just figured it out and sort of thought, this is what we need to do. And a date was set and off we went. Now, there was a big issue of scale, of course. So Adrian's experience had been a workshop of 80 participants with four bus loads of people. And in fact, that would be more than half of our organisation's firefighters. So we needed something that was Tasmanian-sized. <laughs> It was a few more people than that. <laughs> but at the last minute, on a whim, I did ring Christine and said, um, do you want to come along? Would you like to observe what we're doing? And it was a really fortunate afterthought. <laughs> so um, we were back to having our every move filmed, but Dr. Sue Stack joined our ride and she really had the facil facilitation skills that, um, that Phil and I lacked. And, and she really helped us on the day. She just knew how to ask the right questions 
to get the group talking about what they were thinking. And you are talking about 20 very operational. These were all our people who lead plan burns in parts of wildlife Tasmania. She managed to get them to open up and talk, which was pretty incredible. And to actually say, you know, what would you be doing under similar circumstances? And we'd done it. We did it. And most staff said they found it was really interesting and it was worthwhile and it helped them think, think, think things through at a deeper, deeper level. But that isn't cultural change. That's just doing a staff ride of sorts. To actually change, we really needed to embed this more into the way we thought about debriefs and the way we thought about how we learn from things. So over the next 12 months, we worked with Sue and Christine and we put together our manual and um, you can get it off the Bushfire CRC website, Designing the Staff Ride. Uh, we wanted our Remember This video, which we like using from the Lessons Learned Centre, and we wanted an, an Australian one. Um, and so with the support of the CRC, we managed to produce some of those products. And it all looks really great from a management level. It's still not cultural change that's permeated through the whole organisation. But what preparing this did was it helped us at an organisational level to understand what our objectives and debrief for debriefs needed to be and to really think about how we were going to take those processes and get staff to actually learn and change their behaviour and how to actually embed HRO into what people did so that you didn't have to teach people HRO or high reliability principles because they're going to be reflected in your whole approach of how you manage your business and the way you work together as a group. And so how have we made the next step? As a tactical learning tool, the staff ride is great and it can be used in many different ways. And we've now moved to much smaller rides. And in fact, what we've done, we no longer debrief our plan burns when they exceed expectations. We have an after action review and we have embedded the staff ride into that after action um, review. Uh, for all burns that exceed expectations, we will do a review. And using the skills acquired from our first staff ride, we do this sort of facilitated site discussion where we take those who are involved in the burn and we get them to tell us the story as we move from site to site, chronologically through the planned burn. It's really important, being back on site, being back where it happened, people are not only revisiting what they did, um, but they also think about why they were making those decisions and what they were thinking at the time. And generally we are looking at a group of no more than about eight people and the main players who are involved in the operation. We will often have occasionally a less experienced staff member coming along who's just coming up through the ranks. Um, and they'll just be there to observe so that they can learn as well and that they can hear the conversations that are going on and think, wow, these are the sorts of things you think about when you're in charge of the lighting up crew. These are the sorts of the things that the IC was thinking about when we were finding it really hard on that section and really what he was thinking about was how many more burns can we squeeze in this weather window. So it's been really valuable to use this on-site to do our debriefing or after action reviews. Um, we have given as many of our staff as possible training in the human factor workshops being run by the CRC also, which has been really helpful because that's embedded a lot of that thinking into them. Um, you need about two days for this type of debrief or after action review. Um, the first day is spent on site capturing the story and then listening to the chat over dinner. And for the facilitator, you're busy. You're then capturing all these people's stories, listening to them at dinner, and then the next day, you're telling their story back to them. And you're saying, this is what I heard you say. At this point, we've found that, in fact, one of the best things to go into is a SWOT analysis. So the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But I don't call it a SWOT analysis with the group. I just know that that's what it is. And it is such a simple technique, but it has proven to be one of the most powerful aspects of the process because it really has had the groups open up. For it to be successful, the group, the staff have also learned, had to learn to trust the process and that they really had to accept that we weren't doing this to find out where the blame was. We were doing this so that everyone could learn. 
And we've been doing it for three years now, and I think they're trusting the process. They're telling me they're trusting the process. Just from an interest point of view, um, one of the biggest things that our staff have learned through the um, after action review and through some of these high reliability conversations we've been having is the biggest lesson that they've learned has been about communication. And one of the crew who um, was involved in one of these burns that went wrong we had attended a human factors workshop and we're doing the SWOT analysis and we're talking about misunderstanding and miscommunication on the fire ground. And his comment to me was, yeah, like we learned at the human factors thingy, we've got to make sure they get what we mean when we give instructions. But it's so good, it's so valuable, it's so important. And part of the cultural change that's taken place in our organisation is the way people talk to each other, the way they make sure that everybody's actually sharing the same picture. We have moved away from really brutal investigations to a more reflective process that allows those involved to think about the assumptions that have been made without fingers of blame being pointed. And that's where real lessons are being learned. Um, has it worked? Well, I've never had anyone ask me when can they attend the next debrief, but they do ask me when will the next staff ride be, and they are sending me emails saying we want to learn from this one, Sandy. At an organisation level, we've basically had their expertise changing the procedures we have in place. We are planning for failure first. We're not trying to cope or manage when things go wrong. Uh, we will use staff rides for other purposes as well, for tactical learning reviews, as a group learning opportunity, for teaching, as a way of embedding high reliability principles into that organisation. What does cultural change look like? Well, for me, it's when the language of HRO is, is just a part of normal conversation. When I hear crew asking each other, have you done the pre-mortem yet? When I listen to staff briefings and I listen to them make sure that everybody understands what's going on, that everybody understands what their role is. And I know it when they own it. When two friends are bickering over the very important placement and cooking order of meat on the all-important end-of-season barbecue, and you know how important the cooking order of meat is on the barbecue, and the co-workers roll their eyes at each other and mutter, ah, human factors. <laughs> Thank you.